We're talking today about, won't you be my neighbor? And for some of us, this is a little cheesy because it's like the Mr. Rogers line. Um, But we wanted to have a series before we got into Easter that deals with how do we communicate the good news of what it's like to walk with Jesus Christ in a context where people are increasingly isolated and lonely. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but I mean, you don't don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand the more connected we are, it seems like, yes, I have more access to more people in some ways, but I have fewer, deeper, meaningful relationships because everyone's only relating through pixels. In fact, I read a lot of studies this week about how different millennials are from baby boomers in terms of how many significant relationships they have. And so there may be some who are in this room right now. There may be some who are watching online or maybe listening by podcast. The truth is, you, you only have maybe a few folks that you would say really know you, and everyone else is like, well, I know that they're an acquaintance, but I don't feel relationally satisfied. That's a lot of the people, a lot of the time. <clears throat> and would you consider the possibility there are people in your life, maybe even you, who you would say, I really wish someone would be my neighbor. Now, you wouldn't want to be cheesy and say it that way, but that's part of the question of your heart is you're saying, is anyone going to be intentional with me? Does anyone want to open the door for me? Would anyone welcome me into their world? Let me be on the team. Be be someone who explores the person that I am and the gifts that I have to share. That's the question behind this series. And Jesus has got some great things to share with us about it. We're going to look in his word to discover that. But one of the things that gets in the way, and you'll hear this every now and again, is racism, prejudice. And I feel like every time there's something like that blows up in the news, it's like, oh, we better have a message on racism. I wanted to have one before something blows up again. Like, I just think it's healthy. I think that we should do that. I, I really do think this, this keeps people off in their own corners. Even when we're around a lot of people of other races, there may be places in our hearts that we still need to take a second look at. So Jesus is going to help us do that. We're going to look at the parable of the good neighbor. And even though you may not have considered that from a racism or prejudice perspective, it is still in there, and we're still going to learn a ton. So let's take a look at it. It starts with this expert in the law. He comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Meaning which ones of the laws? And Jesus is like, well, you tell me, what do you think? Um, He's trying to test Jesus. Jesus is trying to test him back. And he, you know, he drops Deuteronomy on him. He's like, hey, I think it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Boom, Jesus, what are you going to do with that? Thinking like he's, you know, you can tell by what Jesus says that he's really, he he thinks he's pretty cool. He thinks he's pretty awesome. And Jesus doesn't really go into it because it seems like this guy's got a little bit of a pride problem. But obviously Jesus is like, hey, um, yes, that would be true. If you could possibly do that, if you could obey every law perfectly from the moment you were born, that might be possible. If you really always did love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, if you did that perfectly, that would be a way to inherit eternal life. The problem is you're already disqualified, son. You can't do that. You don't do that. I know you're going to pitch to me that you think you do that, but you don't. There's only one other way, and that is for someone else to live that perfect life for you and then die in your place and give you their obedience. That's really the only way to inherit eternal life because you can't do it yourself. But this guy doesn't have the time of day for that. So um, Jesus is going to tell him a story instead. He's like, yeah, dude, you you could do that. That would be a way you should do that. But you're not going to be able to do that. Let me tell you a story about why. He asks Jesus. He wants to get a little bit of clarity. This is where he seeks to justify himself. It's right there in Luke 10, 29. But he desiring to justify himself. What does that mean, justify himself? It means He's trying to tell Jesus, yeah, like like me, like I got it together, don't I? Like, yeah, the thing you're telling me to do, I already do that, Jesus. Like I've already got this down. Hey, sweet, done deal. We're already done. Um, he's trying to justify himself, and he says, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus doesn't really answer that question the way he's asking it. See, he's asking a who question, and Jesus is giving him a are you the right guy answer. He's saying, who, 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 who can I not worry about, Jesus. Who, who, who do I not have to consider? Who's outside of, you know, the parameters for me? Because I feel like I'm doing pretty good with these kinds of people. And I'm also, it's pretty good of me to know the kinds of people I don't need to worry about. I don't need to worry about loving this or that or the other kind of people. And, and maybe some of us would even say that from time to time. Hey man, I'm glad that like I can love the people I love really well. I don't know, you know, if I really need to worry about the people like that kind of music. I don't know if I have to worry about the people that have those kinds of piercings. 
or those kinds of tattoos. I don't know if I really need to worry about the people who are into that kind of a hobby. It's kind of weird to me, kind of even a little wrong in my perspective. I don't know if I really need to worry about people from that region of the world or that kind of nationality or that kind of skin color. But I know about like, if I'm thinking about the people I think are my neighbor, I'm just gonna worry about these folks. And Jesus is gonna tell a story and say, no, the next person you encounter is your neighbor. Everybody's your neighbor. But I, my question to you, expert in the law, is are you a good neighbor? I'm not saying who is it. I'm saying are you a good one? I'm saying, like, do you meet the criteria of what God would call someone who's actually being a good neighbor? You're not just worried about people that have a little bit different accent than you do, so you get to, like, not worry about them. No, it's everybody. And so he tells a story. He says, hey, once there was this this Jewish man who was on his way down to Jericho. And on his way, he gets robbed, gets beat up, bloodied, probably left for dead. If he doesn't get medical attention, like he's not going to make it. And Jesus says, and then along came these two folks. Now these two people, these two men were a priest and a Levite. Now these are like heroes in the story for most, most of Jesus' heroes. They're like, all right, yes, someone's in trouble. Two good Jews, especially a priest and a Levite. So they're going to be especially close to God. They're going to be God's favorites. They're going to walk in there. They're going to save the day. I'm sure of it. They are the heroes. And yet they're not the heroes. So the first one, he's the priest. And he, you know, he's, he, we get the impression from Jesus' story, he sees what's going on here. Like he knows that there's somebody hurt over there and then he, he crosses over on the other side and keeps on walking. Why does he do it? We don't know. Maybe he's in a hurry. Maybe he's like a priest. He's an important person. He just, in case this person is dead, he's gonna touch him because then he's unclean, can't do his temple work. Maybe he's like, well, if I touch him, what if the bandits are still around? They're gonna take me. I'm just gonna pretend not to see it. Gonna keep right on walking. Okay, so he can't do it. Maybe it's this Levite. Levites were temple assistants. They would take care of chores and rebuilding things and fixing things and administrating the temple. Maybe it's one of these Levites. Man, they're still, that's a pretty, pretty big deal if you're a Levite. And Jesus doesn't tell us why, but for some reason, this Levite keeps right on going. Okay, I think probably he was doing what we do sometimes. You don't want to make eye contact with somebody. You're pretending you don't see him. Like, I'm just going to look at my phone. I'm real interested. What is this? Are you serious on The Bachelorette? No way. How could they do that? And you, you, know, you know they're there, but you're pretending this is the most interesting pixel you've ever seen in your life. I feel like that's what this Levite was doing. He's just pretending he doesn't see what he should see. And then Jesus surprises everybody, shocks everybody who would have been listening. They would not have seen this coming. And Jesus says this. He says, Luke 10, 33, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and he, when he saw him, he had compassion. So this Samaritan sees this dude hurting, dying, and lying there bleeding in a ditch, and he has compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He says, look, this is the only medicinal stuff I've got to maybe keep him from infection. I'm going to pour it on him, see what I can do. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Now this, but a Samaritan phrase, but a Samaritan had compassion. Let me, let me clue us in what, what these hearers of Jesus are hearing. But Thanos <laughs> had compassion. And they're like, what? Thanos doesn't have compassion. He's the bad guy. Or they're hearing, but Darth Vader had compassion. They're like, Ugh, that, I don't see how that works. That's not how the story's supposed to go. That's how they're hearing this Samaritan word. Samaritans can't be good, man. They're not the ones with compassion. See, there was a racial fight going back and forth for the past 700 years between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans, the Jews thought were these half-breeds, these people that had intermarried and worshiped pagan gods, and so they messed up all their Jewish blood. Now, they had forgotten that they themselves were worshiping pagan gods as well. But even so, there was a fight that had gone back and forth, back and forth, centuries. And you know what happens when you find out somebody hates you. You just hate them right back all the harder. And so that's what they were doing. We hate you and we hate you. And so it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and worse. How can a Samaritan be the good guy? How can a Samaritan be the one who goes first and has pity and has compassion on the person that is hurting? You'll notice the Samaritan wasn't the first to come along. He was just the first to be a neighbor. He was the first to love. He was the first to lean in. He was the first that said, I know it might be inconvenient for me, 
but I'm still going to be a neighbor to this person. Dr. Martin Luther King, commenting on this very passage, wrote this. He said, the first question the priest and the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? The good Samaritan reversed the question and said, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? He had compassion. And you know, there's so many parallels for followers of Christ. Obviously, in one sense, we are the hurt individual. We're the ones lying there. And Jesus is the one that comes along as the good Samaritan, different than us, the one who cleanses us, the one who saves us at risk to himself. He does it. And in another sense, he's saying, you guys should be like the compassionate Samaritan. You should take care of those who are hurting. If you're going to neighbor people, hey, listen, you expert in the law, Quit trying to like edge people out of who you were responsible for and just say, the next person I meet is my neighbor and neighbors go first. It, see, it, neighbors take the initiative. Neighbors don't wait. Neighbors don't say, well, if I feel like it or if it's convenient or if I get around to it, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll just keep on my merry way. And it's, I don't wish them ill will, so that's pretty good, right? Like, I'm not glad he's hurting, I just don't care. And Jesus says, no, that's not neighboring. Isn't that a beautiful demonstration of the gospel? The way that Jesus comes down to us and finds us, even though it will hurt him, he still gives away everything he has to save the ones who are hurting and wounded and bleeding and dying. Why? Because Jesus knows, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. It's not what about what I need. It's about what they need. I look at them and I can't imagine eternity apart from them. I, I know they deserve it. I know they're my enemy. I know that they hurt me. I know that they've, they've given the middle finger essentially to God himself by going their own way, by demanding, no, I'll be my own God. I know they've done that. And yet I can't imagine the idea of spending eternity apart from them. I must rescue them even though it destroys my body. I have to do it. Why do people... Why do we do this, man? Why, why do people even get racist? Like, why does this happen? I think some of it maybe is we've been wounded, we've been hurt, or somebody we know was hurt, or we heard that somebody was hurt, that we were like, well, they're my group, and if that group hurt them, then they hurt me, and we just begin to say, they're all like that. They're all like that category of that one individual that I heard about that did that thing. That's how that group is. Maybe sometimes we're, we're prejudiced because we learned it. I think this is the most common, to be honest with you. This is where somewhere along the line, somebody in your family of origin or my family of origin, they said something. They said, this is how they roll. This is what they do. You're going to watch out for that because this is the kind of thing that you can expect from that group of people. But it's learned. And it wasn't good. It's learned, Dennis Leary said this. He said, racism isn't born, folks. It's taught. He says, I have a two-year-old son. You know what he hates? Naps. <laughs> he hates naps. Meaning he doesn't sit there and hate people of other races. A, a, a little two-year-old doesn't need to, like, doesn't do that. If they ever do it, it's because they learned it. It's because somebody said something in their presence that said, this is how you should see the world. This is how these people roll. Or maybe it's just ignorance. Maybe it's just a lack of perspective. Maybe it's just convenience, to be honest with you. Maybe it's, I'm just not around enough people that are different than me, and so all my own presuppositions just become entrenched in my life. I don't have any other inflow. I don't have any other new data. So all I can do is go off old data because I'm so insulated from other people that I maybe shouldn't be insulated from. Here's what we're going to find. Racism is not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. Hey, listen, Christians need to, need to know this because they need to lead the way in this. Racism is not a skin issue. It is a sin issue. There's something wrong with the human heart. This is what the Bible, this is what Jesus, this is what all the authors of the Bible teach over and over and over again. There's something wrong with your and my heart. Our actual mind and our hearts are darkened by sin, meaning it has an impact on us. And I don't just mean when we sin. I mean the fact that we are sinners, it's not that we aren't capable of, of great thoughts and great understanding, but we cannot escape the reality that sin has affected our thinking apparatus. And we can be great-hearted people, but sin has still affected our hearts, and they malfunction in the moment of truth. They do the wrong thing. And they presuppose the wrong things about other people, and they judge other people. They prefer only their own kind. 
And that's sin. That's why James says in James 2, 9, but if you favor some over others, you're committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law. Jesus died for that, for that one choice to prefer all the people that look like you. To say, well, you know, I don't want to be racist. I just, I just want my kids to hang out with the, the kind of kids that look like them. I'm not, I don't want to be racist. I just want, you know, I, I want to be around certain kinds of people that have a certain level of education. I don't want to be racist, but, you know, when I, when I hear that kind of music, I'm like, oh, nothing good's going to come from that. I don't want to be racist, but, you know, when, when I see so-and-so walking in the other neighborhood, I'm like, oh, I hope they don't come over here. What are you doing? That's that's the disease of sin manifesting in, in our hearts right then. That's prejudice. That is me saying that group of people, though I know nothing about those individuals, that group shapes who they are. And so therefore, I don't know that I want to be around it because I'm pretty sure it's true of that person. Guys, it's jacked up. It's messed up. That's not, that's not who we're supposed to be. So how do we do this? How do we neighbor people that are different than us? Here's the first thing we do. We recognize our own prejudices. We recognize the possibility that we might have some prejudices. Because see, some of us are like, no, dude, I'm enlightened man, 21st century. I don't have any of that going on. And, and I give you props for that, for that if that's true. Maybe that is true of you. But here's the danger is you're gonna be like, hey, just because I accept certain um, other races, it doesn't mean you don't have prejudice in your heart somewhere. It doesn't mean there's not entire categories of people who are like, I can't deal with those people that are part of that Democratic or uh, Republican party. You just made a whole bunch of decisions about someone you do not know. You did not listen to them. You did not touch them. You did not hear their heart. You just, boom, that's the category they're in. See, do you, do you see how this can be accidental? Like you didn't even mean to be prejudiced. You just were. That's, that, man, that's the disease of sin at work inside of us. Prejudice, it's prejudging. It just means, hey, I've got an opinion that is not based on reason or any actual experience. I'm just, this is just where I am on it. Yeah, that's, that's something Jesus died to deliver us from. And especially the people of God need to be extra careful to remove it from our hearts when we find it. So I, I put on social media this past week, I just wanted to hear some, from some people. Hey, tell me about your accidental racism. Tell me about times that you ran into racism and maybe they didn't mean to, but it just happened. Okay, and I was really sad to hear some of the stories. And I think that they would say the person who manifested this prejudice or manifested this racism, you know, they would say, well, I didn't, I didn't mean to walk in racism. I just, I assumed you weren't qualified because of your race. Or I didn't mean to walk in racism. I just, I assumed you didn't have insurance. I didn't mean to be racist. It's just when, you know, when I hadn't seen your face and I just heard your name, I assumed you were this race, but now that I know you're this race, I don't date folks of that race. I didn't mean to walk in racism, but see, I, we didn't put you on the team because I just, I don't know, man, like I didn't think white people did this sport well. So, sorry. I, you know, I didn't mean to be racist, but I figured if we were doing this, this play at the school, maybe because of your culture, you wouldn't be interested in that kind of thing. Yeah, that was... That was prejudice right there. Do you see how in each one of those cases, it, it, maybe they didn't mean to, but it still was a prejudgment. They looked, at it, they looked at an individual that said, well, because you're part of that group, I'm categorizing you with my script about what that group does and doesn't like to do. It's evil. It's sin. Here's the reality, my friends. Can we own this? Anytime you begin a sentence with, I'm not racist, but... Dude, that means you're racist. People that aren't racist never say things like that. They never feel like they need to. And hey, listen, we're all, you know, we're all sons of Adam and daughters of Eve. Hey, we all have the disease of sin. What we need to do is have the courage and the boldness to ask the Spirit of God's help to look and say, are there places that I am pre-categorizing people that are unfair? I think if we're really honest, we would be able to say, you know, in my house when I grew up, there were just certain things that were said that maybe shaped how I thought about certain groups of people, right? Like, like in, my, in my family, we just understood maybe this was you. Maybe you were like, hey, people that are rich, they're just greedy. That's just what they are. You know, you're never going to find a rich person that's not greedy. Or maybe in your house it was, hey, if you see someone who's overweight, it's because it's they're lazy. That's why. 
That's what happens. And that, that was just your presupposition that you were given about life. Maybe for you it was, hey man, um, maybe you're a little younger and like, you know, here's, here's what I know about millennials. Millennials, I've just heard it from other people is they lack responsibility. They just don't care about anything. They're just not going to do anything about anything. Maybe for you, you heard, hey man, I, I know the reason that some preachers shave their head is because they're just always so handsome they want to give other guys a chance. And that sounds true. It's just not true. It's not always true. Can we do it? Can, can we do this? Can we admit? Some of y'all are going to get that at lunch. You're going to be like, oh. <laughs> hey, can we do this? Can we admit, hey, maybe, even if I'm not aware of any like racist or, or, or prejudiced tendencies in my heart, it's possible that, that there's groups of people, even if it, it's not a skin color thing, there's, there, there's groups of people that I'm making assumptions about that if the Spirit of God would tune me into it, um, I, I might be alarmed to find that out. Maybe it's, it's really not about um, skin color. Maybe it's more about like, I wish people had my same kinds of opinions. I wish people were articulate like me. I wish people kept a clean house like me. Like I can't stand those people that do that. Or I don't know why people would leave their car in that kind of a way. I don't understand why people let their lawn go like that. Whatever it is, it's an assumption about people that is keeping us from drawing near and keeping us isolated. So what do we do? We recognize, number one, our own prejudices. And then we do this. We love those who are different than us first, intentionally, proactively. We love them first. See, neighbor love, dude, it's not just neutral. Can we get that? It's not just like, I don't wish you harm, therefore I'm loving you. That's not the same thing, okay? It's not just, hey, man, I, th I think that dude's like, I don't know what's up with him, but I, I hope he gets better. I hope he doesn't bleed to death there on the road. So, hey, I, I think I'm being a good person right now. No, that wasn't it. That wasn't what a Jesus follower does if you're a follower of Jesus. It's active. That's the kind of Bible love. That's the kind of neighbor love that Jesus is talking about here. Racism, if you're taking notes, you can write this one down too. Racism isn't just the presence of hatred. It's the absence of love. Racism isn't just the, the presence of hatred. It's the absence of love. It's anytime we don't go first. It's anytime we're not trying to include somebody. It's anytime, it, it, it's not us just saying, hey, I, well, I don't hate you. Oh, well, congratulations, you don't hate somebody. That's not our job though. Jesus is talking about being a good neighbor. He's saying the good neighbor goes first. Neighbors go first. That means we reach out first. That means we say, I want you here first. That means I, I'm not just satisfied for you to be out there somewhere. I prefer you with me. I prefer us together. I prefer to learn from you. I prefer to touch you. I prefer to welcome you in. I prefer to us to be a part of the same thing. I prefer to us all be in unity. I prefer you. I'd rather you were part of my picture than not a part of my picture. And I'm willing to do stuff, actual stuff, not just have thoughts or feelings. I'm, actual, I'm, I'm desiring to do stuff to demonstrate we are one. Can I shoot straight with you? as your pastor. And, and you got to know, man, I love my church. I love my church. I love who's here. I love who goes here. I love it. Here's one thing that I would shift a little bit if I could, okay? And I'm praying I can. I wish it wasn't quite so white around here. Can I just, can I say that, okay? Like for real, man. Like, and, and here's why. It's, it's not because there's anything wrong with the white people here, okay? It's just that as I look at Revelation 7, as I look at how how John has this vision of heaven and all the people that are there, every tribe and tongue and nation and language. We're gonna look at that in just a second. As I look at that, I just feel like, I feel weird that we're, I, we're underrepresenting the entire body of Christ. And I know representation isn't everything. I don't know we live in a specific population, but I think Grays Lake is kind of small. And I really just wish, man, I wish we had more African-American leadership in this church. I wish we had more Asian-American leadership in this church. I wish we had more Indian American leadership in this church. Why? Because I want to represent to the world what the kingdom of heaven is like. Like that's who's there, man. It's not all white. Like it's, it's a myriad of color and it's celebrated by the father. And there's so much we have to learn from other cultures. There's so, there's so much more that we could all bring to the table. That's what I wish was true. We were at a conference this past couple weeks ago at, at Willow Creek. We're, you may not know, you'll hear more about this in the coming months, but we are hosting the, we're a site host for the Global Leadership Summit in, in August. We're going to do that at our church. And so, you know, me and a few other folks from our church, we're, we're with a bunch of church leaders from the, around the nation. And this dude comes out 
And um, I just haven't seen enough of this. He was just an Asian American killer worship leader. Like he tore it up, baby. Okay, like the song was awesome, like gives you chills. And don't worry, he was a real worship leader, so he had all the tight pants and like the, the black jean jacket, all right, and, and the scarf. But I'm like, hey, I haven't seen enough of this, man. I've been saved 24 years, and I've only seen like three Asian-American worship leaders. And I'm sure, well, you know, you go to like some more Asian countries, and that's, you've got plenty of that. But, but there was just something in me that wanted to represent the kingdom more. And I was like, well, praise God for him, man. Finally, finally. What are we doing around here? This should look like the, we have a message that Jesus Christ has united all peoples in his death. And I just want it to look like that. So I don't know, man. I don't know, but it, would you do me a favor? You know, we're praying for 10,000 every day at 10 a.m. We're praying, God, help us reach 10,000 people. Well, pray that only a quarter of that is white, please. Can we do that? I mean, come on. There's just a lot more people out there. I don't want them to all look like me. I want people to walk into our church and say, there's a person that looks like me, and there's a person that looks like me, and there's a person that looks like me. I want there to be so many different beautiful images of God that people feel like, I know I got people here, and not only do I got my people, but I got my people, and we all get it, that Jesus values all of us, and he died for all of us, and he died to create oneness among all of us. Now, here's the reality. It's going to be difficult sometimes. If you're a Christian, I believe you have a disproportional responsibility to go first. You have a disproportional responsibility to go first. That means you can't just be open. Well, man, I'd have more friends of a different color if they, you know, if they approach me. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying you approach. We're saying you go first. You go be intentional. You go, go across the room. You reach across. You say, hey, man, I might even mess this up. I might get this wrong. But it's so important to me that you know, like, I want to be around you. I want you to be my brother and sister. I love you. I want to touch you. I want to be in the same places. I want us to have, like, an actual relationship where we can say, that was weird and that was cool and we're all hugging and it's all good. Like, that's what we need to do. And we need not just wait for it. What are you waiting for? The kingdom is now. Let's do it now. Let's get after it. It is not neutral. It is active, even if sometimes I get rejected. Even if sometimes I'm misunderstood with what I'm trying to do. Okay, so we're going to biff it up sometimes. But here's what Jesus said. He said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another, that you have tangible love, that you can see it. It's not that you go to Bible studies, that you underline a bazillion verses, or that you had 20 million baptisms. He didn't say that was the way. Those are great, but that's not, that's not the way people know we love each other or that we're his. It's by the way we love. Come on, somebody. Hey, listen, I'm preaching and um, here's, here's a little, Dan is here and he's listening. Thank God. Um, hey, a few others. Okay, Carla, thank you. Um, I just want to give you a little pro tip. We'll stop the message here for a second to give you a pro tip. See, when the preacher's doing well, if you want to participate, you should say stuff like amen. Okay, amen. amen. All right, good. Now, here's a little secret that you might not have known. When the preacher's doing bad, you start to amen and it'll get better. It's like an amen by faith. You're like, it ain't good yet, but... Come on, Jesus, we can do this thing. So, um, if, you know, if that's, if that's your way, go ahead and try that out sometime. Hey, um, one example of actual, tangible, go-first neighbor love to me happened in 1996. Now, this is kind of meaningful to me because I was 18 in 1996, and the heroine of our story is 18 in 1996. But there was a rally in Michigan. It was a KKK rally. And the police knew about it. They showed up. Protesters showed up. Okay, and so, so these groups kind of square off. And somehow or another, one of the men who was on the KKK side got himself over into the protester side. And he's got like a Confederate shirt. He's got all these white supremacist tattoos. Okay, like this is going on. And somebody yells, kill the Nazi, kill the Nazi. And they begin, the protesters begin to lay the beat down on this guy. Like he's on the ground, they're kicking him, punching him. And it becomes one of those alarming moments. Dude, they might kill this guy. Like just with the amount of violence that is rushing at him all at the same time. But there's a young African-American woman. Her name was Keisha Thomas. And she was there. And without even really thinking about it, she runs and dives and covers this man from the people that are trying to hurt him, even though in all likelihood, he would want to hurt her. So he's trying to pro she's trying to protect her enemy. You can see the, the pictures up there. Here's what she said. She was on Oprah two years later. She said this. Oprah said, why would you do that? 
And she said, it was the right thing to do. I felt like two angels had lifted my body up and laid me down. And if you're covered by God, you know, you do what you're supposed to do. You don't worry about anything else. Why would she do that? Because she's a follower of Jesus Christ. Because that's what neighbors do. Neighbors go first. Even if it will hurt them, even if it's inconvenient for them, even if it's difficult for them, neighbors will go first in order to cover even their enemies. Neighbors go first. Did you know that Jesus Christ went first? Jesus Christ, thank you, Dan. Yes, he did. (laughs) Jesus Christ went first. For real, he initiated with you and me. Like there we were not caring at all what he thought, not even maybe aware, and he comes while we were yet sinners and he dies on the cross for us. What does he do? He runs toward he and she who were his enemies. And you may not feel like I, you were, I wasn't Jesus' enemy. You maybe didn't feel like you were in your heart, but your actions were. Your actions were a front to a holy, holy God. They were saying, I don't need you. I'm gonna do it on my own. And Jesus says, I know that you do not know what you are doing. And so even though you're hurting me, I'm gonna come because my heart is filled with compassion for you and you need me. I'm calling you to be the good Samaritan, but I'm gonna be the good Samaritan to you first. And I'm gonna take your place. And it doesn't matter to Jesus. It doesn't matter what our background was. It doesn't matter what our nationality was. It doesn't matter what our skin color was. It doesn't matter where we came from. It doesn't matter how much bad we did, how much bad we even might do at some point. Jesus says, I want you. It doesn't matter if you're Nigerian. It doesn't matter if you're Russian. It doesn't matter if you are Irish. It doesn't matter if you're from Jamaica, man. It doesn't matter where you're from. He says, I want you, and I want you to be part of my people, and I'm dying in order to unite every one of you together. And if you're going to be my people, then act like it and go first and neighbor those around you. And so today, I think maybe we could do a little bit of business with God. I think we should recognize, hey, listen, it's not too late. And there's still more work to do on the inside of each one of our hearts. So let's all bow our heads. I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and we're gonna pray this with the Lord. Listen to me read this scripture as you're bowing your heads. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne before the lamb. They were clothed in white robes and had palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God from our God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. Where does it come from? Not from my God, not from her God, not from his God, from our God, the God who united and reunited all of us together in Christ. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I want you to listen to the verse right before that, for there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Though they are two different races, there's no difference. Now the same Lord is the Lord of all, and he richly blesses all who call on him, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That is your people if you are a Christ follower. That's who your people are. And so, Lord, we want to acknowledge right now, we want to be that church. Would you come fill us with your Holy Spirit? Would you come heal us? our hearts. If you would say, Jesus, I need you to heal some prejudices in my hearts, just in case they're there, even if I don't know they're there, would you lift your hand right now? Across this room, even if you're watching online, close your eyes and lift your hand. If you say, Jesus, I need to be delivered from prejudices, even if I don't know what they are. Lord, that's our prayer. Would you deliver us? Would you forgive us for harboring unforgiveness and resentment at different times? Places we gave ourselves excuses to keep on walking and in bitterness instead of forgiving like we've been forgiven. Lord, places where we accepted lies that were told to us as little kids and we need to curse them and call them lies. Those are not true. God, would you deliver us as individuals, purify our hearts, help us to value and adore every family member of yours. Help us to neighbor like Jesus who goes first. You can keep your You can pull your hands down, but keep your heads down, please, and eyes closed. Because here's the reality. For some of us, you're a lot like that expert in the law. You compare yourself to other people, and you're like, but I'm pretty good. I don't have as much racism as Carter's talking about right now. Yeah, you might not, but here's the problem. You still have fallen way short of the standards of a good and holy and loving God. And there's no way for you to ever be good enough. Just like for that lawyer, you can't be good enough. He couldn't be good enough. You can't be good enough. The only one who can be good enough 
is God himself. And that's why Jesus came. That's why he lived a life among us in perfect obedience. That's why he hung out with sinners like you and me, because he wanted to be around them. And that's why he allowed himself to be brutally murdered on a cross to pay for your and my sin because he couldn't stand the thought of eternity apart from us forever. And that's why, as we're all sitting here in a prayerful spirit, that's why for some of us, we need to come home to Jesus right now. We need to say, Jesus, I've been trying to do this on my own. I need to surrender my whole apparatus to you. Not just like, I don't just need you to forgive my sin. I need you to give me a new heart. I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit so I can do things your way in your power and in your strength. Every one of us needs Jesus desperately to give us his heart, to love through him. All over our church right now, if you, that's what you would say, I need Jesus. Would you raise your hand right now? If you just say, Jesus, I need you to be the one who forgives me, but also the one who sustains me, the one who empowers me to love. If you're watching online, would you lift your hand right now? If you need Jesus in this church, say, yes, Lord, I surrender in Jesus' name. We're all praying together, agree in your heart, Lord. We surrender. Forgive us for the times we've just missed your heart or said something stupid or said something in jest or said something in accident. Forgive us for our sin. Fill us with your spirit and teach us how to neighbor by going first. Lord, there's people out there. They've got a quiet cry in their heart. Will somebody notice me? God, would you help us to go first and be that people? And everybody said, in Jesus' name, amen.